I am happy tonight to introduce you to Dr. Michael Metzger. Uh, he has a quite extensive uh, background and I'll try to, to run through this so that you can just hear some of the connections that he uh, has or is involved in. Anyway, he's a professor of business at the NK Business School in Costa Rica and a visiting assistant professor at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. And there he teaches marketing in all different, uh, different uh, aspects. He serves as a visiting professor on the faculty of the School of Business and the University of Michigan in the Department of Marketing, where he taught many graduate level classes in management, marketing, uh, consulting, et cetera. He served as the academic director for several international exchange programs for Inkai Business School with such world-class institutions as the University of Michigan, the Ross School of Business, UCLA, Anderson School of Management, and Cranfield School of Management in the United Kingdom. He has done research and which reflects his interests in various interdisciplinary fields. And those include marketing, social marketing, services marketing, social enterprise, nonprofit, and corporate and social responsibility uh, issues. He served as the director of INCHI Social Enterprise Knowledge Network and has led INCHI's research efforts in this field for four years. And you'll see some of the stuff that he is involved in there. He taught extensively through Latin, throughout Latin America and consulted for Latin American films on the implementation of marketing and social responsibility, business plans and sustainable business practices. He was published in academic and professional journals, presented in conferences in the U United States, Europe, and Latin America. He received his PhD and MA from the University of Michigan and an MBA from the University of Toledo. You'll hear much more about what he's involved in so I'd like to now present Dr. Michael Metzger for um, his evening presentation. All right, thank you, John. I'm gonna share my screen, okay? That is fine. All right. All right, here we go. And we're good. Um, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, Sister Rosine, um, can everyone see my screen all right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So I don't know how many of you were, uh, I can just see a show of hands because this will tell me like how much not to repeat <laughs> uh, because we had technical difficulties last time I was here. Mm -hmm. uh, how many were here the last time I tried to speak and <laughs> actually didn't get a chance to? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm going to give an abbreviated version of uh, what I talked about last time. And uh, there's some really cool videos. Um, I'll re rely on John and Sister Rosine if they think I should share them or not, uh, about some of the stuff that I've done in Costa Rica and Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And so this talk is, it's more kind of like just a story and a conversation about what I've done um, over the years in the area of sustainability and how strangely my business career has kind of, and teaching career has kind of taken me to uh, sustainable business models and practices and working with um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations and businesses on bringing about uh, social change in a way that's really beneficial to the environment and to uh, social equity. And that those are themes that are fragile in the developing parts of the world. The governments are underfunded and they have weak institutions. So the environment is, it's amazingly robust, but it's also fragile and the social systems are, are weak. So uh, there's poverty and uh, <clears throat> in much greater degree. And uh, so there's vulnerable populations for exploitation from business. So all these things are related and that's what my talk is about. And I wanna give you specific examples of a concept called appreciative intelligence. And 
relate this to the Lake Erie rights of nature. So we had uh, a, an activist for what's known as LIBOR, uh, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, and that is to recognize Lake Erie as a living legal entity entitled to legal rights, just like human beings are, and ironically, just like corporations are, which are not living human beings. But a lake is a living ecological system, and so it should be legally represented, and, and it should be able to, uh, it can't defend itself, but we should be able to defend its rights. And that was uh, the talk of Marky Miller um, last time. So she actually did most of the talking because technology failed. So, so let me go with my, my conversation here about uh, appreciative intelligence. What is it? And this is about Lake Erie because uh, after six years in Costa Rica, my family and I, my wife Maureen and our daughter Katie, who uh, arrived at Costa Rica where she was, I think, barely two weeks old. And she spent about her first six years in Costa Rica. So, uh, but this is about Lake Erie. And this is me before when I was a, a younger person, um, probably in high school, uh, sailing on, on Lake Erie on a windsurfer that my dad and I built. Before they were commercially available, this was in the 70s. Um, we built this and we would sail it on Maumee Bay. So. Lake Erie is, and Toledo is really near and dear to my heart. I grew up there, I went to school there, spent a lot of time on the water. Uh, my home for six years was this place, was Inkai Business School and the Center for Latin American Sustainable Development and Competitiveness. And our home was just beyond this academic building and I would walk there every day after walking my daughter to school. And Costa Rica, if anyone's been, um, I mean, that is uh, just a, a vibrant, lush, green ecological paradise. About a third of the land mass is set aside as a national park. You got more biodiversity than you'll probably find in most parts of the world, right in that little country. Um, so that was our home for a while. And there um, I was the director for the Social Enterprise Knowledge Network. Uh, we studied organizations with a social mission. A lot of them had ecological missions. And when I came back uh, to U of M, I was then the director of the uh, U of M Sustainable Development Latin America program. And that was an annual course that would travel and spend time in Costa Rica. Um, the SACIN, that's the acronym for Social Enterprise Knowledge Network. We, we would publish books and cases and articles about social enterprises, organizations with a social mission, as well as an economic mission. Um, and so these are some of the things that, and, and focused on Latin America. SACIN was a consortium of nine Latin American schools, one from Spain, Esade, and one, from, and Harvard Business School was the founder. Harvard actually founded INCAI, the school where I, where I teach and I'm on faculty. Um, they founded INCAI, um, John F. Kennedy actually asked the Harvard Business School faculty to found uh, a business think tank in Latin America uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Why was that? Anybody? Why, why, what, what was going on in the 70s? Why did uh, John F. Kennedy want a top flight business school uh, to promote free markets in Central and South America? And that's the mission of INCAI. Anybody want to answer that question? A little history there? Don't know. Uh, would it have something to do with the Peace Corps? Well, he also, yeah, he, he started the Peace Corps to also promote um, West, the West's, and particularly the United States interaction with developing parts of the world and to encourage um, democracy and learn about other parts of the world. But the business schools, because Central and South America was the battleground between communism and free market capitalism. And so he wanted institutions there that would promote free markets because the communists were knocking on the door too and they wanted to establish uh, communism as the do dominant political uh, economic system. And so INCAI was part of a strategic initiative to promote free markets and uh, enterprise in Latin America. So along with uh, 
free markets come some uh, and, and business and in the course of conducting business, there's some externalities. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. Businesses, of course, we want to create profits. Um, the good thing about that is in the process of creating profits and innovating, we, we employ people and we improve uh, their quality of life and standard of living. And that's part of uh, our mission in Central America too for INCAI is to promote a robust free market private sector uh, that raises the standard of living. Um, and, but there's also sometimes an ecological impact. So these are the three pillars of sustainability, Eco economy, equity, and ecology, or people, planets, and profit. And uh, sometimes when we conduct businesses, at the, it's at the expense very often of the in environment. Um, sometimes it exploits uh, people in uh, low wage, underdeveloped countries, and that's not good either. Um, so there's philosophies uh, that promote these, these isms, these worldviews, capitalism, uh, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations in 1776, Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848, criticizing capitalism and its, its excesses. And in 1962, Rachel Carson wrote A Silent Spring, which was criticizing both systems for their neglect of stewardship of the environment. And, uh, uh, and communism is equally capable of abusing the environment on enormous scales, uh, just like capitalism. So what we have here are emerging philosophies and it's captured in this triangle or this fractal. And any type of business model or business transaction, it's going to create or destroy value. And that value can be economic, it can be social, it can increase standards of living, or it can exploit workers and put them in vulnerable positions. It can, in the rare circumstances, really work with the environment and not at the expense of the environment, but very often it's at the expense of the environment. But in Social, ec ec uh, social Enterprise Knowledge Network, that organization I, I ran for a while on INCAI, uh, we would look for business models that found the sweet spot where they were good stewards of their local and regional environment and the communities in which they operated, but they were also profitable and they kept the lights on and they employed people. So, uh, so I'll refer to this fractal, uh, three pillars of sustainability from time to time. Um, so in the process of doing my, my work at uh, INCAI, I would study uh, social entrepreneurs, and I studied a number that I'm going to share with you, and I've talked about a few weeks ago, but I'll give you an abbreviated version of those stories. And one day I met uh, some researchers from uh, Case Western Reserve at a conference, and I presented on some of these social entrepreneurs, and they told me these guys have, these guys have appreciative intelligence. And I said, do they? And I said, they said, yes, they do. And you should write a, a chapter in my book about, about these guys. And I said, Congrats, I'm happy to, but do, tell me what's appreciative intelligence. So we're all aware of the different, different types of intelligence, um, uh, the mathematical, uh, the linguistic and verbal, um, interpersonal intelligence. Some people are good with people and they read people well and they, they can carry on a conversation. There's kinesthetic intelligence. People are good with their bodies. They're dancers or maybe they're athletes. Musical intelligence, uh, visual intelligence, visual spatial intelligence, artists. Um, intrapersonal intelligence is knowing yourself. Um, well, these guys told me that there's something called, and this is from Howard Gardner, by the way, a Harvard uh, educational psychologist who came up with the concept of multiple intelligence. Well, there's, there's a few more, um, and one of them is appreciative. And I said, what is appreciative intelligence? And he said, well, it's these entrepreneurs that you're studying out in Latin America. It's these people that can look at situations that appear to be hopeless or dire, and they see the potential there, and they see the prospects for something. They can make something 
out of what appears to be abject poverty or, or, or not a good situation. Appreciative intelligence is the ability to reframe and perceive the generative potential in challenging situations and to engage in purpose, purposive action to transform the potential to positive outcomes. Metaphorically speaking, it's the ability to see the mighty oak from the small undeveloped acorn, right? So some of these guys that I met in my, in my travels were in a situation which was um, lots of poverty, uh, not a lot of employment options for the people that resided in, for example, rural Costa Rica or the rural Bolivian Altiplano. But these guys were able to reframe their context and appreciate the positive aspects of that situation and see, have a vision for how the future might unfold. And I want to share with you their stories briefly. The first one is called uh, Costa Rican Entomological Supplies. And the entrepreneur is Joris Brinkerhoff. Now he was a U he's a US uh, citizen. He's now a Costa Rican national, but he did, he did the Peace Corps and he studied um, botany and butterflies. And he lived uh, out in the jungle with the butterflies and he did a lot of Peace Corps work, but he saw these butterflies and he really got to understand them. And he realized that there are museums in the West that would really like to have an exotic array of butterflies in their, whatever you call, wherever they display these things in their butterfly museums. And so he would breed butterflies, send the pupae or the cocoons over, and then they would come out and they would uh, be in these museums. As a matter of fact, there's, a matter of fact, I think Sister Rosine, there's a sponsor of Save. I think it's a butterfly farm and it's not, it's like yeah. out by White House or something. And yeah, I, butterfly. I guarantee you that they get their butterflies from George Brinkerhoff in Costa Rica. In fact, I, I even knew this because when I visited him once, I saw that they were buyers and I said, oh my gosh, you know, the butterfly farm, I think it was in White House or somewhere around there. And uh, that was pretty interesting. So those butterflies, you know, small world um, came from, from Costa Rica. And uh, so he, so Costa Rica is interesting because of the microclimates, it has a real, probably more uh, variety of butterflies and Latroptera or something of the, the other moths that those species of, of insect than almost any other part of the world. Now, the negative thing though is rural Costa Rica, it's, it's poor, it's a developing part of the world, all right? But Joris looked at that poverty and he looked at the ecological diversity and the geographic diversity and the microclimates and the really diverse vegetation. And he recognized that you get very different species of butterfly living and breeding in different parts of Costa Rica. So if he could get these rural farmers to set up butterfly farms, little enclosures to cultivate these butterflies, they could be his suppliers. And you could only do this in a very distributed way. You can't create a butterfly factory. You need the microclimates and you need the unique vegetation of each microclimate to create this variety of butterfly. So Joris put all this together and he said, I can employ these rural Costa Ricans in butterfly farming and they can be my suppliers and I can actually pay them a good living wage. The only other alternative for these rural Costa Ricans was to work in the horticulture industry, which is working in enclosures with fungicides and herbicides and that's really not good for your health. So it's kind of like an early death sentence. So this was a really good business model that uh, employed rural Costa Ricans. And guess what? It, it employed women in disproportionate numbers. Why is that? Well, because men kind of, there is like a stigma of working with insects, even for poor Costa Ricans. They, they thought, I don't want to work with bugs. That's crazy. But the women were like, they were like, I'll give it a try. And they had this 
temperament and the ability because it's a very delicate environment and they did a great job and they were very very good entrepreneurs and some of the stories if you click on some of these pictures which i'm not going to do right now it'll take you to videos interviewing these ladies and uh in one of them she's kind of laughing how you know her business was so good that her husband she needed her husband's help so she employed her husband and he quit his job in the horticulture <laughs> industry so they could grow their butterfly farms and then she said she later admitted rather uh, kind of shamefully that, you know, and she, things were so good that she could eventually buy a car. And that's pretty big for a poor Costa Rican to be an owner of a car. And so these ladies, they do they do pretty well. And Joris exported a lot of butterflies. He did he did OK. Um, so he created this. He basically created the butterfly industry. And he, at the time of this case that I wrote, he employed more than 400 family breeders and paid them a fair price. So they had an above average annual salary for a Costa Rican. And all this was from butterflies that people never thought twice about. But he had this vision and he put it together and he created an industry and gainful employment. And he improved the communities in which these families lived and worked. And, and he turned this city, this it's a village, where he lives, La Guasima, into the butterfly capital of Costa Rica. And they hosted like artist uh, competitions where they would paint murals throughout the town. And interestingly, they recaptured the indigenous plants and local biodiversity in order to cultivate the butterflies that were indigenous to that area. So previously where the horticulture industry would bring in non-native plants, in order for the butterflies to come black, they had to recapture that with, with local flora and fauna. And they had to cut back on herbicides and pesticides. So this is one of those business models that had the socioeconomic sweet spot. It created economic value, it created social value, and it created ecological value. So it was a it was a win win win, um, and it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story, and it created an ecological awareness. Um, and uh, it, it's just a it's just a, so I I could talk on and on and on about Joris, but that's one story of this social entrepreneur who possessed appreciative intelligence. He could see the potential and the future. And he, when other people saw poverty and he could develop it. Um, so uh, there's Joris, interesting, wonderful person. Um, the next story I wanna tell you was this guy, Javier Hurtado, who is a, a Bolivian. Now, Javier was uh, kind of a radical activist in his youth in the uh, 50s and 60s, and he was a third international Trotskyite, which is a communist. So he was uh, a member of the Communist Party in his country. And as I told you, Latin America was the battleground for communism and, and capitalism. And uh, Javier was exiled from Bolivia for his... Uh, political activities with the Communist Party. He went to Germany and uh, he enrolled in school and he got a PhD in sociology on how to organize rural peasants with the thought of going back and doing that. Well, he went back with his degree in sociology and he found out that he could get really good gainful employment with NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And he worked with non-governmental organizations, which were basically about alleviating poverty in rural Bolivia, which, by the way, is probably the poorest country in all of Latin America and the Caribbean, with the exception of maybe Haiti. But it is really poor, especially the Bolivian Altiplano. It's a very remote and harsh environment. So Javier was working with NGOs for 18 years. And he realized, he, as he told the story to me, he said, Michael, after 18 years of working with the Bolivian campesinos 
in the Altiplano with these NGOs, I realized that we were creating a cycle of dependency. We never got them out of poverty. They were just getting better and better at being poor and saying, help us. And he said, I decided I was going to go to business. I was going to start my business and I was going to make these Bolivian farmers uh, entrepreneurs. And I was going to provide them access to markets in the West with their indigenous grains. You might be familiar with real quinoa, a highly nutritious grain, which is really found basically only in the Bolivian Altiplano. So previously, when NGOs were telling these very poor Bolivian farmers, you need to grow corn, potatoes, and stuff that people eat in the West, which are not indigenous to that area. And by the way, you need to use these genetically modified seeds, and you got to dump a bunch of uh, this fertilizer on it. These guys were so poor, they couldn't even afford that stuff. But Javier thought about it, and he said, Real Quinoa. It's organic. They never had the money to put, apply the herbicides, pesticides. And so what they were left with was organic real quinoa and Europeans will pay a premium for that stuff. And so he formed Irupana, Irupana Organic Bolivian Foods. And he employed these uh, rural Bolivian uh, farmers in the Altiplano, which basically looks like the moon. It's super, but it does grow real quinoa quite well. So um, he was able to appreciate the potential in a situation that looked pretty bleak and, and quite poverty stricken. And he was able to create something and employ family farmers and not only do so, but preserve the cultural history and the, um, you know, the foods, the menu, the historical cuisine of the uh, Quechuan Indians. And he created this company um, and they export in large quantity to the US and Europe and they even branded their own product now. So he has coffees, he has real quinoa. And, um, and this is a funny story is um, so, Previously, these uh, Bolivian farmers who had learned to become dependent on NGOs, basically they learned to be very good at po po poverty, being poor. I was, before I got to see Javier, I was sitting in the hallway and these guys came by and, and they said, hey, are, are, do you work with Javier? And I said, no, I'm a, I'm a researcher. I'm here to research Javier. And these guys, because they thought, they said, no, they said, no, they said, are you an NGO? Do you work for an NGO? Because they could tell I was a Westerner. And I said, no, I'm not an NGO. And they said, I said, I'm a business professor studying Javier. And all of a sudden they changed their conversation. And they said, because we were talking about, you know, poverty stuff. And they said, you tell Javier that, you know, we can do better and he's not paying us the margins we think we deserve. And there's another supplier and we're ready to switch, change suppliers so we can get better margins. We think Javier is, is uh, not being fair to us. And I went into Javier after talking to these guys said, Javier, get ready. These guys are coming in and they're ready to negotiate and they're like gonna play hardball with you. They're talking margins and all that kind of stuff. And he laughed and he said, that is exactly what I was hoping to, to cultivate here is people that had a sense of um, empowerment and, and would go after and be entrepreneurial and not just look for handouts. So he said, mission accomplished. So that's the story of Javier. I don't want to talk about uh, um, this other story, maybe, maybe another talk in the future. This is Gail, who's another Peace Corps Westerner who founded the Costa Rican Humanitarian Foundation in the poorest part of San Jose, regarded as like the most dangerous part of Canada. San Jose, but she created the Costa Rican Humanitarian Foundation and founded a Montessori school and a thriving community of Nicaraguan refugees who left the Civil War in Nicaragua. It's a beautiful story. Um, but I want to fast forward to after six years, we returned from Costa Rica to Ann Arbor. And uh, we were actually in Sylvania for, for a few years, and I was commuting to Ann Arbor, actually for quite some time, for, for almost 10 years. 
Um, and my daughter went to the West Side Montessori. My wife and I commuted to Ann Arbor. So we love Sylvania and we love our neighbors, beautiful campus of Lord's College. Um, so but we eventually made our way back to Ann Arbor. And here we are. Fast forward, I come back. Uh, in, interestingly, fun fact, there's a book written by an Ann Arbor person called Homer the Hummingbird. And it's about a hummingbird that makes the migration from Costa Rica to Ann Arbor. And I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I thought small world. But anyways, I came back to this. I said, what's happened to my beautiful lake? It was 2014, August 4th. And you can't drink the water in Toledo. Restaurants are shut down. God forbid you go windsurfing in that lake. You're going to get sick and they're gonna, you're going to wind up uh, having your stomach pumped or something horrible. So I came back to this. Climate change was exacerbating um, this algae bloom in the Maumee Bay and in Lake Erie. And uh, it was from, it's partly due to climate change and increased temperatures, but uh, excessive farming and runoff uh, phosphorus from the Maumee Basin makes it way down the river and here to the shallow waters of Lake Erie where it bakes in the sun and um, creates these horrible algae blooms. So I come back to this, but not, not much later, I see this, uh, this young Toledoan on the news at the United Nations advocating for the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. And I was actually at the United Nations a couple weeks earlier representing INCAI for a responsible management education program. And then here I see Marky Miller. And I just thought, how about that? Here's Toledo commanding the world stage, the eyes of the world looking at Toledo and Lake Erie. And these young people are advocating for the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, the beautiful lake that I grew up sailing on and windsurfing on. And I thought, appreciative intelligence, what's going on here? Is this another story of taking a situation that looks really bad and turning it into something really, really potentially good? Well, uh, you know, Marky and her friends, and there's lots of people working along with Marky, and I, I haven't mentioned their name, but I just happened to know Marky because I reached out to her on Facebook and she came and spoke a few weeks ago and she's really wonderful and passionate and articulate, but there's others that are doing a lot of work and I'm sorry, I'm not mentioning their names right now. Um, but she was kind of the spokesperson and she's holding up a sign here. The system is fixed. We need to break it. It's fixed and it represents corporate interests, but not the interests of the Lake Erie or the people that depend on it. And so they made a, a lot of noise and they got it passed. They got the state of Ohio to recognize in a referendum, Lake Erie Bill of Rights. The Lake Erie has legal, the right to legal representation. But it was, um, you know, go behind closed doors and smoke filled rooms and some well lined corporate pockets got legislators to nullify that uh, that verdict, and um, it is no longer recognized as uh, worthy of legal representation, and that's sad. So, but I originally looked at this and I said, is there an appreciative intelligence at work here? Um, is this an, another situation where somebody sees the potential in in a very challenging situation? So, I want to talk a little bit about now a little bit about um, appreciative intelligence and uh, complexity theory. And I want to make this again, if you don't mind, and if you will indulge me a conversation, um, because uh, I'm writing a paper about the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, and I want to apply the framework of appreciative intelligence. Because what I've observed as a marketer and a social science scientist is regarding all these really pressing issues of the day, climate change, 
locally, it's the Lake Erie algae blooms, and it has a massive economic impact when you've got to shut down the city for the weekend and restaurants can't work and people can't even shower. It's a big mess. So there are social implications, economic implications, and uh, environmental implications, obviously. So, but I noticed that science is not enough to solve these problems. These are complex problems with many moving parts, some of them social. And I wanted to take this concept of uh, complexity and uh, a fractal design, which is, uh, it's a geometric shape, which is, has certain properties that are self-replicating. It's like an iterative feedback loop and we see as it, as it takes shape, traveling not a linear curve because it's fractal geometry, it's not like normal algebra, but we see these shapes in nature. If you look at the, a, a leaf or if you look at a tree, you see fractal geometry at work, you see symmetry and you see self-replicating symmetry. So this is a little bit of pseudoscience, it's not really hard science, but it's a good metaphor to think about the issues of the environmental challenges that we face. When I talked about sustainability and the externalities of conducting business on the economy, on ecology and on social equity, I applied a fractal concept. There's these three things that work in every single business transaction. We either create value or we destroy value. And the value can be ecological, social, or economic. They're, they're interrelated. You cannot really separate them. Um, so they're represented by ecologism, socialism, and capitalism. So if we take this complexity theory, systems theory, and we look at the issues facing basically any environmental issue, we quickly come to understand there are many moving parts and they're dynamic, they're unpredictable, but they're interconnected, they're nonlinear. It's not like a cause and effect Newtonian understanding of physics, they're nonlinear and it requires a different approach to solving these complex environmental problems. Um, there's a field called complexity leadership theory, whereas it's leadership that is adaptive and creative and learning, and it works in complex, unpredictable, uh, nonlinear environments. And this is much of what we encounter in, uh, I think, in environmental issues. Um, there's something called the Van Koch curve. It's an example of fractal geometry. And it's not easily defined by math, but, ge but fractal geometry defines it quite well. And much of math is about replicating the world around us. It's about understanding the world in a mathematical way. So if we take a triangle in the Van Koch curve and we simply multiply it, we can come up with these really intricate nonlinear shapes. What this represents is, I use another metaphor, is like there's a DNA involved in this shape as it takes shape. The DNA is, is, a, is a triangle. It's a triangle shape which is multiplied exponentially and it results in this ever evolving shape and it takes on nonlinear properties. We're not sure what it's gonna look like. We see this in nature all the time. So my question was, can we take our understanding of complexity and appreciative inquiry and address this issue of what happened to Lake Erie in August 6th, 2014 with this algae bloom and something that we wrestle with every single uh, summer. So I'm, gonna, I'm writing a paper right now on the conversations that took place at Michael's down in East Toledo um, that brought Marky Miller all the way over to the United Nations in New York uh, advocating for Lake Erie. And I want to use this concept of appreciative inquiry, which is the ability to 
to see the mighty oak in the acorn. In other words, to reframe the present, a horrible algae bloom in Toledo, and turn it into a positive and advocate for a better future. So it's complexity and deep appreciative inquiry, uh, which is a collaborative, highly participative, system-wide approach to identifying and enhancing life-giving forces that are present in a system when it's performing optimally for humans, for the ecology, and, and economically. And uh, so I want to look at the whole Lake Erie issue from the lens of uh, a field of inquiry known as appreciative inquiry, applying appreciative intelligence. So um, there's a 5D model that I'm learning about um, in appreciative inquiry. It's where we essentially define what are we looking at? We're looking at, choose to focus on the positive. In other words, don't focus on corporate polluters, bad. We got to go after them. What's the positive aspects that we want to be focusing on? Because there's a, there's a heliotropic quality to this. You guys you know what heliotropism is? Any botanists out there? Mm -hmm. What's heliotropism, anybody? You can probably... Something would go towards uh, the sun. Yeah, so if you got like a like, sunflower like, or a plant, mm -hmm. will grow towards a life-giving force, the sun. Whatever generates positive generative energy is where humans even will gravitate towards that. So what's the positive about Lake Erie? Rather than saying, these corporate guys, let's get, let's get them. Let's take them down. We're going to court. Is it possible to reframe, reframe Lake Erie and the, the things that it has, the natural general generative qualities and focus on that and focus on even not just the ecological things that it brings to our our community of Toledo, but there's economic benefits to Lake Erie too. There's a vast sports industry that depends on the lake. There's uh, the ecology, we depend on drinking water and there's social aspects of it as well. Can we reframe this? We're focusing on the positive in our inquiry. Look at what's best. And the way we look, do this applying appreciative inquiry is we talk about stories so if this were an appreciative inquiry intervention, and think about this because I think you can apply it to many scientific issues. You ask people that are impacted by these issues, tell me the stories of the good things when it works. Tell me the good stories about Lake Erie. Like I grew up spending many hours on Lake Erie with my dad on a sailboat that he and I built. And we built a windsurfer and I'd be following him on the windsurfer around the Maumee Bay and we'd have wonderful conversations on that. And that was a big part of my youth, uh, that time on the water. And it was, uh, and there were lots of other people, there's yacht clubs and there's a fishing industry around that and there's tourism. So, you know, tell those stories of the generative positive qualities of the issue before you, those life-giving <coughs> stories. Imagine what could be, locate the themes that, wind throughout these stories and select topics for further inquiry and then design shared images of a future that everybody would, would want. What should the future be? And find inno innovative ways to create that future. So move you know, from a focusing on, on the negative to how can we accentuate the positive and and, and be, be uh, encouraged by those naturally generative qualities that come along with Lake Erie. Reframe the issue, appreciate the positive and see how the future unfolds. So I foresee writing a case and then these cases are pedagogical cases. I take them to my students and we discuss this and we would probably take the appreciative inquiry framework and say, how could we make the case for Lake Erie in a compelling way that draws on appreciative intelligence and turns a bad situation around and 
creates a heliotropic or helio, yeah, tropic quality that people are drawn to and they wanna, they wanna participate and make this a great lake. Let me take this issue and I'm gonna take that up with Marky and her organization, but let me pose a question for you guys. Um, so if I can, if this could be maybe a little bit participative, using this appreciative intelligence inquiry framework to something we're all familiar with, the science and the politics of wearing a mask to prevent the spread of COVID. So just a few, just last weekend, I was in Sylvania visiting my mom and I got my hair cut. And the lady, I was at Sheer Madness down in Sylvania. It's a really great place. Debbie, she's wonderful. She let me in really early before everybody got there so I could be careful so I wouldn't put my mom in danger. But the lady was doing someone's nails while I was getting my hair cut. And she was saying Sylvania had uh, something on Friday nights where everyone gathers. I think it was like shopping or, you know, some kind of a festival atmosphere. And she was saying it was amazing. It was packed and very few masks out there. Very few masks. And she was really disappointed and shocked. The scientific evidence for the efficacy of masks at slowing the spread of COVID is overwhelming and widely documented and supported. So how can we take something that has become politicized and framed as though you're infringing upon my individual rights and frame it in a way that is positive and motivating for people to put on a mask. So how do we take this issue using appreciative inquiry? Because again, the science is there. We all know the science, but that falls woefully short of getting enough people to wear their masks to keep the vulnerable safe and slow the spread of this nasty pandemic. So if we ask the first question, what is the inquiry? Choose the positives to focus on. So how can we take the negative, you are infringing on my personal freedom and you're asking me to wear a mask. Help me, how do we, how can we, what's the, what's the, the affirmative, not the, not the negative of this, how can we, put this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, some input to give. I work in a Catholic healthcare organization and our member organization is called Catholic, <clears throat> excuse me, Catholic health association. And uh, they were selling uh, face masks, a couple of which I have in my possession and they say, uh, and I, I have it probably somewhere, I think, in the house here. Uh, it's very colorful, and it says love on the top and your neighbor underneath it. It's the positive message that what you're doing is caring for others when you're wearing the mask. That is a wonderfully positive message. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. That's a similarly, I... I realized, you, you like my jacket? I, I got this corduroy jacket thrifting with my daughter. She loves to go thrifting. And my wonderful wife who's down there, Maureen, sewed, sewed me this mask and I put it on. I said, oh my gosh, this goes really well with my jacket. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mm -hmm. it's like a fashion statement. I can wear this one around campus here at the Ross School of Business. Mm -hmm. today. I'm, you know, I think I'm looking pretty good. So uh, yeah, you can you can make a you can make a fashion statement. You can make mm -hmm. a, a, a a a a statement of religious uh, affiliation or just a statement of love your neighbor, take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think I think there's also a feeling of uh, you could reframe it kind of as empowerment. Um, there's so much that we can't do around this pandemic that's an infectious disease and it makes you feel like you don't have control over things but 
wearing a mask is actually empowering. It gives you some way, a very effective, but very simple way to uh, impact the epidemic. Um, so if we reframed it as that, I think maybe people would see it more positively. It's kind of, it's as Kristen said in the chat, it's like wearing a mask, it's protective for you and for the wearer too. It's something you can do. Mm -hmm. Or simply besides love your neighbor, love yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael, you were mentioning about the complex society and uh, you're looking at Western society and particularly the United States, that uh, you have a scientific community that is more futurist oriented. In other words, they come up with uh, new, new things to move into. Uh, you do have a manufacturing base that uses base materials and puts together product for people to use. And then, of course, we have a social system that uh, deals with education and the way that society operates itself. I'm thinking a needed key is the collaboration of faith communities to provide the moral and ethical barometer in which to gauge human activity. In other words, in a complex society, recognize the potential of faith communities to contribute to the common good. Well, that's a wonderful comment. And part of my description of my talk today was there was something at the end about spirituality and um, and a stewardship of God's creation and, uh, you know, uh, humankind returning to their God-ordained role of, of, of stewardship. And I had the benefit of going, uh, getting some, just as I grew in my faith as a young person, I actually went away as a young scholar to uh, a seminar called the Pew Charitable Trust uh, Young Scholars Program. And it was a bunch of people of faith, young people from all different disciplines, led by some just powerful academics that had a rock solid faith. And it was so inspiring. And he just really driv drove home the, the message of the, what he called the creation, Christian scholars call the creation mandate, which is to be stewards of God's creation on earth as it is in heaven. And that was wonderful. Something that just breaks my heart is, is um, when I see the, uh, a lot of the, the right and the evangelical community uh, get behind things that are so destructive to the nature and actually get behind, uh, you know, opposition to things like wearing a mask and taking care of each other. And it just perplexes me and it makes me sad. Um, but I agree with you. Um, but yes, the humankind is so complex. What's the best, though? What are the best stories? And you've told a few of them. I think your story, um, Nancy, of, uh, you know, the, I think it was Nancy that told the story of the mask, you know, selling the masks is, a, is, a, is one of those good stories. Um, if we find the, what are the qualities that we find in the positive stories that we all have? We all probably have some positive stories about things that, that go well with these with these these issues you know uh around wearing wearing this mask um uh -huh. but how can we imagine what could be identify these themes whether they're fashion or whether they're making statements faith mm -hmm. statements um you can even make a statement on the right you could wear a mask that says don't tread on me or you could wear a Trump mask or an NRA mask or whatever you wanted to. Um, uh, you know, whatever end of the political spectrum, you don't have to kill somebody by giving them COVID to make a political statement. <laughs> Put on a, an ultra right mask and, and let the world know how you feel about uh, politics. But let's take care of each other in the process. There's a lot of options. Um, what could be? Let's imagine what that could be. And then let's design what should be. Let's create shared images for a preferred future. And then finally, the destiny. What will be? Find innovative ways to create that future. So I go back to that Sylvania scenario that I overheard the, uh, the, the woman at the nail salon, the beautician, talking to someone saying, yeah, I couldn't believe it. The place was packed and nobody had a mask on last night. So what if Sylvania 
were to give out masks, you know, maybe they say Sylvania and they got the little tree emblem on them or something and Sylvania strong, you know, and it's part of your civic pride that you wear these masks, you know, or, or maybe, you mm -hmm. know, um, what else could we do to turn this around from making it some kind of a, a seemingly oppressive thing that's being forced upon you to something where it's, it's actually, um, it's, 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 it could be on a national level, an example of patriotism or on a local level of your civic pride for your community, you know? Um, so I found this appreciative inquiry uh, model interesting and I share it with you guys because I think it has something to lend to the sciences and to these issues of sustainability. I think the science is not enough. I think we need, a, we need a, a framework and a model. And I think appreciative inquiry might be very helpful to take the science, reframe it in a positive way that's compelling and empowering and moves people to deal with the algae bloom and uh, moves people to keep their community safe and COVID free. Um, and such things. So appreciative inquiry. This is from David Cooper writer who really kind of founded the, uh, the field. He's at Case Western Reserve. It, it's, it's based on a reverence for life and it's essentially biocentric in character. It is, a, it is an inquiry process that tries to apprehend the factors that give life to a living system and seeks to articulate those possibilities that can lead to a better future. More than a method or a technique, appreciative mode of inquiry is a means of living with, being with, and directly participating in life of human systems in a way that compels one to inquire into the deeper life generating essentials and potentials of organizational existence. And that is, uh, that's appreciative inquiry. And I want to revisit this Lake Erie Bill of Rights, write a case about it, and give it back to my students and give them this framework and say, let's pick up the ball here. Um, we fumbled. Corporate America hit us hard. This is funny to hear a business professor at the Raw School of Business talk like this. But I'll tell you what, I, you know, I, I said earlier, I study marketing kind of like an epidemiologist studies cancer. Um, but also I look at marketing and marketing when done correctly and business and strategy when done well, looks for defensible niches. And nature is all about niching. Nature is all about finding your ecological niche. You can look at an economy and as, an eco, as an ecological system and businesses look for their they can defend and survive in a symbiotic way. And good marketing is about niching. Good marketing is niching, actually. So anyways, um, that is, uh, that's my story. Um, and uh, that is uh, how I kind of went full circle, took on a long convoluted trip. Uh, started at the Ross School of Business as a marketer, got my PhD, was here for four years, went to Costa Rica, came back. I picked up a lot of tools. I met a lot of interesting people along the way. One of them was Sister Rosine, introduced to me by my mother. You got to meet Sister Rosine. She does sustainability stuff. She'll be interested in what you've done in Costa Rica. That's what brings me here tonight. Um, so thanks for... Uh, listening to my story and thanks for contributing. Um, I'm uh, happy to share it and uh, I really think. Can I ask a question? Yeah. W would you please uh, repeat the bibli bibliography for Framers of Mind, uh, author and publisher, and then also Appreciative, the book, Appreciative Intelligence. I certainly will. Um, there's a couple of... Uh, and I'll tell you afterwards why I ask. Okay. So uh, it's in my presentation. I have a picture of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <clears throat> the author is David Cooper Writer. For which, which book? Uh, 
I think. Framers of the Mind or the other? Framers of the Mind is Howard Gardner. Okay, and the publisher? Um, on that I'm not sure, but if you were to if you were to look at like Google or Google. Amazon, yeah. Yeah. Framers of the we'll Mind, Howard Gardner, and that's about multiple intelligence. That's about, yeah. and then the other one is uh, appreciative intelligence and appreciative inquiry. And I'm actually working through this book right now. Um, and uh, the author, the author of this book is it's quite good. It's uh, Jane. McGregor, M-A-G-R-U-D-E-R, Watkins, W-A-T-K-I-N-S. So it's mm -hmm. Jane McGregor Watkins. And the mm -hmm. second author is Bernard J. Moore, M-O-H-R. Thank you. And mm -hmm. if you're interested in my why the question, yeah. um, I'm not a scientist and was absent the day science was taught. But I thought that the, the concepts in there could apply to the renewal of any organization. And for me, convinced of the current dysfunction in the institutional church that uh, I would use, I could apply ideas from those two books to my incessant concern for church renewal. Mm -hmm. That, yep. that's, I, I see that in the, the churches that I, that I, well, that I uh, uh, attend um, I see it in much of Christianity on the right, the evangelical right, which is my, my church home historically. Although now I see these issues as being very ecumenical, but I see the church, um, sadly defining themselves by things they're against. They're against this and they're against that. And that's contrary to appreciative inquiry. Appreciative inquiry is what are the generative positive yeah, things. I understand that. And that's why, you know, uh, virulent clericalism, misogyny, uh, you know, uh, organic ritualism, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, are concerns of mine. And I, that you've got me thinking about paths to renewal that are, are unknown to me before tonight. Good, great. I'm glad that got the gears turning on that. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll bring up is in the chat box are the links for the two texts. For the what? For the two texts that were mentioned. Oh, you are so electronically skilled. <laughs> well, that came from not me, but. Uh... <laughs> I think that was Maureen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and Maureen. I want to, can I copy that? And uh, this, uh, this business of faith communities uh, playing their part in the affairs of society is also a representation of a change in paradigm. And the paradigm is away from uh, religion as being a benefit to individual salvation and perhaps to held it with everybody else to a movement into a salvation of a commons or a mutual salvation where each faith community can contribute to the welfare of the whole. Mm -hmm. That's salvation history as I understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, hence with the new age, the need to take on a new paradigm. Uh, my opinion on a paradigm is that the reason why people are in opposition to a good idea is not necessarily because they won't see it, but more importantly, that they can't see it. And what means do you need, do you have to have in order to allow them to open up their, their vision to be able to consider and see it for the value that it is? Mm -hmm. An article that really helped me with what you're talking about, John, 
was in the November issue of Commonweal entitled The New Integ... I can't pronounce the damn word. Integralist. Uh, it, it's really an understanding of the kind of mind you were talking, you were talking about, the, which basically is maintaining their personal comfort with what they have been comfortable with in the past and the fear of any change. Mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't a long article, but it, it opened up a, another path for approaching uncomfortable current realities. Mm -hmm. You know, it could apply also to the political scene. Mm -hmm. Dr. Metzger, I found your talk tonight to be very uplifting and positive. Something I, you know, you've approached it from a very different uh, aspect that I had not thought of because I've learned a lot and been interested in Lake Erie and that and how to in, empower other people in a positive manner about it and looking at ways to get them empowered. And I, I'm, that really sparked some re good, good interest in me. Thank you. Uh, you're, thank you so much for the feedback. I'm, I'm so glad. Very helpful. Very good. Well, I, I will uh, let you know, Sister Rosine, how my talks with the LIBOR organization goes and the application of this uh, uh, appreciative inquiry, and uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to come back at some time. I'd love to just participate in your organization uh, mm -hmm. as uh, not necessarily a speaker, but a participant, um, because I believe in what what you're doing. And I'm at, at this point in my career, my life, I, 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 I'm committing myself. I mean, have the luxury, I, uh, at least I think I do, of being able to do the things I feel strongly about. Um, and save uh, embodies those things, educating young people um, on science, making them sci uh, scientifically literate, but also environmentally, uh, ecologically literate. Um, that is the time of, of uh, our generation and future generations and the, the things we are going to leave them to contend with. And mm -hmm. so I'm desperately doing what I can uh, to feel good about the world, I'm going to leave my daughter, uh, and I think save. I think that's what saved us too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I just think the positive, uh, the positive focus of this is really, really good. Yeah. Um, yeah perhaps also for feedback, uh, Michael, uh, I came up with 20 indicators of wealth and prosperity, and uh, appreciative inquiry is mounting that up to 21. So thank you for that. <laughs> you know, people, the children have to learn to love, you know, the, the environment. And, um, you know, when we had the kids program here at Lourdes, um, you could just see how much they appreciated things like, one little girl said, ma'am, she said, I always saw these butterflies in books, but I never saw them in real life. And, you know, and other kids would say, I couldn't wait to come to, to summer camp because I know that we're going to be outside and we're going to see some things. And, and when my mother's working, I have to stay in the house, you know. Yeah. So you and the, what Arbor Day Foundation put out, a, a, it's like a four or six page thing. And it says children just love trees. They love to get involved with trees, you know, and to even find, well, maybe some of them don't have a tree in their neighborhood or whatever, but uh, there are new people now, uh, the, the, a lot of the central city places where they're, they're growing their own things. And, uh, you know, and the children are appreciating where all these fruits and vegetables come from. They never even thought about it. So these um, uh, inner city gardens are are really playing a part, I think, in appreciation. Definitely. If we think about music as something where we feel something we agreed, nature is therapeutic. <laughs> yes, it is. John, if you could please share the 
the link to the, I understand you're recording this. I'd like to share it with my mom. She was unable to be here tonight. I'd like to give her the link and go over there and let her watch it. I'm sure she would enjoy it. She'll like it. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, after we're done, it'll take me about 15 minutes to compile it. And uh, we will save that, Michael, and we'll put it to an area that uh, for anybody that missed it tonight, uh, they will be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Thank good. you. That's good. And Sister Rosina, well, I think uh, it's yep. winding up time. Yes. If there's no more questions that people have or insights or whatever, um, I think we'd like to all um, um, welcome Michael for being here today. Thank him for coming uh, to showing us a bigger picture in, in um, the saves uh, next year's theme, 2122 is going to be on healing. So appreciation, appreciative intelligence is definitely a way to begin to heal. And so that's our focus for next year. So I think we're right on target and you just are, you know, giving us some input so that we can charge ahead into the future. Awesome. So Michael, thank you very much for coming uh, and doing this again because of the, the technology problems we had last time. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening and for inviting me. And thank you for uh, what you do with SAVE. Um, I, I